The Almighty's Conditions Thousands of years ago, a mighty God lived among all the living creatures. He had not yet created humans. The rabbit was the most talented creature at that time. One day, Rabbit visited the god at his palace, which is also in the jungle. It is a pleasure having you in my palace. What can I do for you? Almighty deity, you have control over everybody and everything in this forest. You are a true master. I need a favor. What kind of favor? Just one thing. Please make me wise and intelligent. Well, well, well. Everyone wants to be rich. And you're asking me to make you smarter. Why? Because I want to be more intelligent than all the animals in the forest. Hmm, fine. But you'll have to show me what you're capable of. Because I was thinking of making a separate species and granting them wiseness and intelligence. If you prove to me that you're capable, then I will cancel my plans for the creation of humans. What do you think, hmm? I'll do whatever is necessary. If you can get me five blue birds, five white butterflies, a bee as big as you, then I'll see what I can do for you. <laughs> I'll get them. I won't fail. In the forest, Rabbit enters looking tired. He sits on the floor beside a pond. All kinds of animals enter and start drinking water from the pond. Then they leave. Five bluebirds enter and drink water from the pond. Then they start playing and jumping. <laughs> Today I'll know what I'm capable of. No, it can't be. It's not possible. That's not true. I cannot believe it. No, they are not that many. The five bluebirds approach him. Hey, rabbit, what are you talking about? What's the matter? It's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell us what's wrong. Oh, someone told me that you could come with me, but I know that is impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> are you kidding? We never get tired. We always fly long distances. Flying doesn't make us feel tired. We can go with you wherever you go. The five bluebirds laugh and dance around the rabbit. Great! <laughs> five white butterflies enter and start drinking honey from flowers by the pond. Wow, those are the most beautiful butterflies I have ever seen. <laughs> but, but no, I don't think they can do that. That would be impossible. <laughs> what am I thinking? The five white butterflies approach him. Hey, Rabbit. What are you talking about? What's the matter? Oh, it's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell us what's wrong. Uh, well, someone told me that you could come with me. But I know that's just impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> Are you kidding? You're not serious, right? We never get tired. We always fly long distances. Flying doesn't make us feel tired. We can go with you wherever you go. The five white butterflies laugh and dance around the rabbit. <laughs> Great! A big bee enters and drinks honey from a flower. What a beautiful bee. But no, I don't think she can do it. That would be impossible. <laughs> I must be crazy. The bee approaches him. Hey, rabbit. What are you talking about? What's the matter? It's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell me what's wrong. Someone told me that you could come with me, but I know that is impossible. You would get tired of the trip. 
Are you kidding? No, you, you couldn't. I never get tired. I always travel long distances. <laughs> Perfect. Let's go, everybody. Yeah. 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 Hey, wait. You haven't told us where we're going. That's a big surprise. <laughs> Is it good or bad? No, oh, good, of course. Come on, before it gets dark. At the God's Palace, the rabbit, five bluebirds, five white butterflies, and the huge bee stand before the God. I was waiting for you. The God was looking at the five birds, five butterflies, and the bee. I see you brought to the company. Will you grant my wish now? I don't think so. Why not? If I make you more intelligent, I would be making a big mistake. How come? Because you are already very intelligent. Then, am I more intelligent than the other animals in the forest? You've always been smart, but you didn't know it. What is your wish? They all start talking at the same time. Rabbit leaves the palace, walking out triumphantly. The End The Toothless Beast This story is from ancient times, when humans did not trust dogs and only relied on them for security purposes. Then, when the dog gets older, they have no use for it, and man leaves them alone in the jungle to fend for themselves. A farmer once had a faithful dog called Leonardo, who had grown old and lost all his teeth so that he could no longer hold on to anything. One day, the farmer was standing with his wife at the front door of their house and said, Tomorrow I plan on taking old Leonardo out into the jungle because he's no longer of any use. His wife, who felt pity for the faithful beast, answered, He has served us so long and been so faithful that I think we should give him what he's earned. Uh, what? You're not very smart. He doesn't have a tooth left in his mouth, so there's not a thief in the world who would be afraid of him. So now he can leave. He has served us well, and for that he has good food to eat. The poor dog, who was lying stretched out in the sun not far off, had heard everything and was sorry that tomorrow was to be his last day. He had a good friend, the wolf, and he crept out in the evening into the forest to him and complained of the fate that awaited him. <coughs> said the wolf. Be of good cheer. I will help you out of your trouble. I have thought of something. Tomorrow, early in the morning, your master is going with his wife to make hay, and they will take their little child with them, for no one will be left behind in the house. During work time, the parents will need to lay the child under the hedge in the shade. You lay yourself there too, just as if you were going to guard the little one. Then I will come out of the woods and carry off the child. You must rush swiftly after me as though you were going to take the child away from me. I'll give you back the child, and you will take it back to its parents, who will think that you have saved it, and will be far too grateful to do you any harm. Rather, you will be in high favor, and they will never let you be in need of anything again. The plan pleased the dog, and it was carried out just as it was arranged. The father screamed when he saw the wolf running across the field with his child. But when old Leonardo brought the little one back, he was full of joy, and he pet him and said, Not a hair of yours shall be harmed. You shall eat of my food freely as long as you live. And to his wife he said, Go home at once and make old Leonardo some bread sop that he will not have to bite, and bring the pillow out of my bed, and I will give him that to lay upon. From that day on, old Leonardo was as well off as he could ever wish to be. Soon afterward, the wolf visited him and was pleased that everything 
had succeeded so well. Ahem. <clears throat> for payment of the favor I did for you, you will turn a blind eye. When I have the chance, I carry off one of your master's fat sheep. Don't count on it. I will remain true to my master. I cannot agree to that. The wolf thought that the old dog must have been joking about not agreeing with him. So, one night, he came creeping about in the night and was going to take away the sheep. But the farmer, to whom the faithful Leonardo had told the wolf's plan, caught him and dressed his hide soundly with the flail. The wolf had to back off, but he cried out to the dog, Just you wait, you scoundrel! You shall pay for this! The next morning, the wolf sent the wild boar to challenge the dog to come out into the forest so that they might settle the so-called agreement that the wolf thought was broken. Old Leonardo could find no one to stand by him but a cat with only three legs. As they went out together, the poor cat limped along and at the same time stretched out her tail into the air in pain. The wolf and his friend were already at the spot appointed, but when they saw their enemy coming, they thought that he was bringing a sword with him, for they mistook the outstretched tail of the cat for a sword. And when the poor cat hopped on its three legs, they could only think every time that it was picking up a stone to throw at them. So they were both afraid. The wild boar crept into the underbrush, and the wolf jumped up a tree. The dog and the cat, when they came up, wondered why there was no one to be seen. The wild boar, however, had not been able to hide altogether, and one of his ears was still visible. While the cat was looking cautiously about, the boar wiggled his ear. The cat, who thought it was a mouse moving, jumped upon it and bit it hard. The boar made a fearful noise and ran away, crying out, Spare me, please! Please, the wolf is up in the tree! The dog and the cat looked up and saw the embarrassed wolf, who was ashamed of having shown himself to be afraid and he made friends again with the old dog. Then the three of them lived happily ever after till the day when Leonardo passed away on the loving laps of the farmer and his wife. The End The Frog and the Grasshopper Once upon a time, two friends were living in the Amazon rainforest. Their names were Mr. Grasshopper and Mr. Frog. They were best friends, but they never invited each other at their home for any reason. One day, they were sitting beside the lake. The grasshopper and the frog lied on their backs on the ground, side by side, gazing at the sky. What a beautiful day. Yes, it is. Do you come down here often? Once in a while. I spend most of my time in the well, you know. Yeah, I don't like wells. They're too dark. You should come down one day to visit me. I have an idea. Why don't you come down to the well tonight for dinner? My wife will prepare a special meal. I'll light some candles. Please say yes. Well, sure. Why not? Good. I should go. I have to get everything ready. See you then. After the frog left, Grasshopper kept staring intently at the blue sky and thinking about what to wear for dinner that night. That evening, Grasshopper arrived at the well. There were some candles lit. The frog was sitting at the table, and Frog's wife greeted the Grasshopper. Please come in, Mr. Grasshopper. You have a lovely home, Mrs. Frog. Thanks. Honey, your friend is here. Tell him to come in. Please, join us at the table. Dinner is ready. Grasshopper and Frog's wife walked over to the table and sat down. I'm glad you came. You have a nice home, and it's not too dark like I thought it would be. Oh, no, it's not. I, I lit some candles for you. Yes, that's very nice of you, especially because I don't like to be in dark places. I already washed my forelegs. You can do the same. There's a water jar over there. Oh, good. 
Grasshopper washes his forelegs and makes a loud noise. My friend, can't you leave your chirping behind? Grasshopper sits at the table and tries to eat without rubbing his forelegs together. But it is impossible. You're chirping again. Be quiet. I can't eat with such noise. I'm so sorry, my friend. Honey, you are being rude. Grasshopper gets angry. I can't eat. Uh, anyway, I'm I'm not hungry. Oh, but I am so sorry, Mr. Grasshopper. Mm, don't you worry, Mrs. Frog. You know what? Come to my house tomorrow night for dinner. I'll be glad to go. You will have to forgive me, but I have other plans for tomorrow night. What other plans? Remember, I promised to watch over my sister's little tadpoles tomorrow night. Oh, yes. I forgot about that. Then I'll go by myself. Grasshopper stands up and waves goodbye. Don't be late. Oh, no, I won't. Grasshopper leaves and Frog continues eating his dinner. The very next day, at dinner time, Frog hops toward the grasshopper's house. Oh, I feel terrible. Last night I was rude to my friend. I feel so guilty for the way I treated him. As soon as I get there, I'll tell him how sorry I am. Frog arrives at the grasshopper's house. Wow, you're early. Hello, my friend. I came early because I wanted to tell you... Grasshopper interrupts Frog. No more talking. Come, please join me at the table. But I, I need to tell you something. Grasshopper interrupts Frog once again. Dinner is getting cold. I already washed my four legs. There's a water jar over there so you can wash your legs too. Oh, oh good. I'm starving. Frog hops over to the water jar and washes his legs. Then he hops back to the table. Oops, you better go back and wash again. Oh, why? What did I do wrong? After all that hopping in the dirt, it made your forelegs dirty again. Frog hops back to the water jar. He washes his legs again. Then he hops back to the table. Mmm, looks delicious. Stop! Now what? Please don't put your dirty paws into my food. Go wash your hands again. Frog gets angry. You just don't want me to eat with you. You know very well that I must use my paws and forelegs in hopping about. I can't help it if they get dirty while hopping between the water jar and the table. You're the one who started it last night. You know I cannot rub my forelegs together without making a noise. Well, yes, but that's why I came early, to tell you how sorry I am. Frog heads toward the door. Where are you going? I'm, I'm going home. Please come back. Forgive me. Do you still want to be my friend? Of course. Come back. Let's enjoy dinner together. We've both learned a lesson. You have to accept me as I am, and I will accept you as you are. Frog sits down at the table, and both start to eat. Oh, this is the best food I have eaten in a long, long time. And there's more in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> the End Lion and Rabbit This is a very old story. In a forest... All animals lived together. One day, a lion arrived in that forest. He was very dangerous, used to eat any animal whenever he wanted. Upset about this, all the animals of the forest made a decision and went to meet the lion. All the animals in the forest have made a decision. Hmm, what have you thought? Every day one of us will come as your food. You do not need to find prey. Hmm, okay. So, this is the thing? 
But why should I listen to you? Majesty, if you keep eating animals every day like this, the forest will be empty, and even you will not get any food. After listening to all the animals, the lion said, Okay, fine. Now every day, one animal became food and went to the lion. One day, when there was a rabbit turn, he deliberately reached late there. So late? Where were you for so long? Even after eating you, my hunger will not be satisfied. Majesty, there was another animal that came with me, but... But? But what? What happened? Majesty, on the way, we met another lion, and he ate it. What are you talking about? There can be no lion in this forest except me. Where is that lion? Show me. How did he dare to eat my food? Let's go, your highness. I will take you there. The rabbit took lion to a well. Majesty, that lion is hiding in this well. The lion sneaks peek into that well. He saw his reflection in the water. The lion jumped into the well to kill the other lion, and he drowned. The little bunny saved his life and life of other animals with his wisdom. All the animals were not tired of praising the rabbit. And after that, the animals started living happily. The End If you enjoyed this story, please like and subscribe our channel and press the bell icon to get future updates. And don't forget to comment! The Magic Horse Once upon a time in Persia, at the royal palace, all the kingdom's artists, craftsmen, and strangers would present their skills to the king. If the king was pleased, he would grant them a fine gift. One day, a traveler came before the king and presented an artificial horse. Your Majesty, never has such a thing ever been seen as wonderful as this. But any toy maker can make a toy horse. This is not just a toy, Your Majesty. On his back, I can ride through the air with the greatest of ease to the most distant part of the earth in a very short time. The man demonstrated the skills of his mechanical horse. The king was amazed and asked to purchase the horse. Oh, your majesty, I couldn't possibly sell such a valuable horse for mere money. Well then, so what do you want? I must have this horsey. The stranger thought for a moment and then offered to give him the horse for free if the king would give him the hand of the princess. The king was about to agree when his son, Prince Darius, came into the room and spoke up in protest. Um, forgive me, father. Were you just about to let this guy marry my sister in exchange for a toy horse? The king, somewhat embarrassed, denied it and asked his son to examine the horse. Prince Darius approached the horse. He leapt onto the saddle and pulled the lever. In an instant, the horse rose high into the air. The king was very pleased, but suddenly realized that his son was so high he could be hurt. He ordered the guards to seize the traveler and put him to prison. Far away in the sky, Prince Darius was carried through the clouds with breathtaking speed. He tried using the lever to turn the horse off, but it did nothing. But he examined the horse further and found another lever, and when he moved it, the horse started to descend. The prince came down close to the ground. Spotting a rooftop higher than all the others, he landed the horse upon the roof of the palace. 
he came to some steps below. A princess had already been awakened by the sounds she had heard on the roof. She instructed her guards to bring the trespasser to her. The guards brought the prince before her, and he fell on his knees. <clears throat> Forgive me, princess, for awakening you. I am the son of a king. <clears throat> that means I'm a prince, and that's the most important thing about me. The lady was Princess Nadia, the daughter of the King of Bengal. The princess felt glad to hear all about his adventure. Over the next few days, the two of them got to know each other, and before long, they fell in love. One afternoon, the prince said to her, Ah, oh, my princess, I was thinking about our future, and I must go back to my kingdom and ask my father for permission for our marriage. Plus, he would like to know that the magical flying horse didn't smash me into the ground. Want to come? She agreed. The next morning, they went to the magical, dangerous mechanical horse. Flipping the lever, the two took off, and in 30 minutes, they had arrived at the capital of Persia. The prince first took the princess to a cottage in the woods near the palace. Stay here while I go get the toy maker out of prison before he's executed, and I'll mention to my dad that I'm not dead. Most of all, I want to tell my father about you. He'll prepare a reception to welcome a princess. Then, maybe after dessert, I'll tell him I want to marry you. He explained to her how to operate the magic horse in case she might need to flee for safety while he was away. A thief behind the bushes had heard their entire conversation. But can you blame him? They were staying in his cottage. Hee <laughs> hee, what luck! A princess alone and a magic horse! I'll take her to the Sultan of Kashmir, I'll get a fine reward for her, and I'll keep the horse. <laughs> the thief waited for the prince to disappear into the woods. Then he captured the princess, tied her up, and put her on the magic horse. He got on too and pulled the lever just like the prince had said, and the horse immediately rose into the air. The prince, still on the ground, in the woods, was surprised to hear the cries of his princess flying high overhead and he could do nothing about it. While the king was overjoyed to see his son and ordered a stay of execution for the toy maker, he understood why his son must leave again. The prince determined never to return until he had found his princess again. The Sultan of Kashmir was very impressed by the thief and delivered the reward. Then he escorted the princess to his palace. The next morning, he ordered his attendant to tell princess to get ready for the marriage on the same day. There was only one thing she felt she could do. She misbehaved and acted as though she were a crazy and spoiled princess. The Sultan was soon told of this strange development. He offered large rewards to any doctor who would cure her. Meanwhile, Prince Darius had been traveling through many countries, uncertain which way to go, because he didn't have his flying horse anymore. With nearly all hope gone, he rested on a rock. A few local farmers came by and told him about a princess who had gone mad at the day of her wedding to the Sultan of Kashmir. Suddenly, a flicker of hope lit the prince's heart. Could this be the same crazy princess he fell in love with? And he was determined to find out. Arriving at the capital city of Kashmir, he put on the clothes of a doctor. Then Prince Darius, disguised as the doctor, told the Sultan that indeed the princess could be cured but he would need to speak with her alone. The Sultan agreed. As soon as the prince entered her room, he took her hands in his and whispered, It is I, Prince Darius, your beloved. This lab coat is merely a disguise. In more additional, superfluous, detailed whispers, the prince shared his plan with her. Then he returned to the Sultan. <clears throat> uh, your Majesty, Sultany Peppery, sir, there's a small chance I can save her and bring her back to sanity. You see, she must have touched something enchanted, or watched too many movies as a child. Unless I can examine the magical item, I cannot cure her. The Sultan remembered the magic horse. He summoned the horse and showed it to the doctor. Upon seeing the horse, the doctor said, This is indeed the very magical object that enchanted the princess. <clears throat> Let this horse be brought out into the square before the palace, and let the princess be there. In a few minutes, she will be cured. The following morning, the magic horse was placed in the middle of the square. The prince, posing as a doctor, 
ordered torches placed around the horse for light. The princess was brought out and led to the horse. The pretend doctor placed her upon the horse. He then ran around it and threw magical black powder into the torches, which raised a cloud of smoke around the horse, so that no one could see the princess and the horse. And hidden in the smoke, the prince mounted the horse, pulled the lever, and the magic horse rose into the air. Sultan, a bride's heart must be earned. It cannot be purchased. That same day, the Prince of Persia and his beloved princess arrived safely at the Persian court. The father rejoiced at the son's return and immediately ordered a great feast. And so the prince and princess lived happily ever after. And the toy maker too. The End The Fox and the Stork Once upon a time, two very good but odd friends lived in the forest. Their names were Mr. Fox and Mr. Stork. The Fox was very cunning and the Stork was not so smart. One day, the Fox invited the Stork to dinner. We never invite each other to dinner, ever. Would you like to come to dinner at my place? Sure! What will you cook? It will be a surprise. What day and time shall I come? How about tomorrow night at seven? Sounds good to me. See you tomorrow. See you and be on time. I will! The next day, the stork arrived on time at Fox's house. Hello. Come and sit down. Dinner is ready. Oh, ho, ho. tell me, what did you cook? I cooked a delicious soup. I'm sure you will like it. But when the stork sat down at the table, the fox served the soup in a very shallow dish. What's wrong? Uh, it's just that I can't eat it with my long bill. Oh, really? Well, at least you can wet the end of your long bill in it, right? Well, yes, but uh, never mind. Anyway, I hope you will return this visit and come and dine with me soon. Of course I will. How about tomorrow night? I'll be there. So that night, the stork went home hungry. The next day, the fox showed up on time at the stork's home. Come on in, my good friend. I was expecting you. What did you cook? Since you are my special host, I cooked your favorite food, a delicious soup. Oh, really? Sure, come on in, sit down, dinner is served. But the fox was surprised to see that the soup was served in a very long-necked jar with a narrow mouth. Ah, the soup indeed looks delicious. But my good friend, I can't even fit my snout in this jar. Oh, really? Well, at least you can lick the outside of the jar, right? Now the fox was very angry with this behavior of Stork. But cunningly, he remained calm and decided to teach him a good lesson. So he said, Well, maybe we can start over. How about you come over to my house tomorrow night and have dinner? I'll be there, but uh, from now on, you have to bring your bowl to dinner. So the next evening, the stork went over to Fox's house for dinner. Hello, good friend. Please sit down. Dinner is almost ready. So, tell me what you made for supper. I made a delicious stork stew. It is just missing one ingredient. Stork. Ah, uh, but I am a stork. <laughs> I know. And then the fox chased the stork out of the house and over the hill. And for many miles, the fox chased the stork until he finally caught him. After a long chase, 
fox came back to his house with feathers in his mouth and sits at the table, shakes open napkin, and starts to eat his stew. He enjoyed his delicious stork stew. So the lesson learned, my friends, don't try to outfox a fox. The End If you enjoyed this story, please like and subscribe our channel and press the bell icon to get future updates. And don't forget to comment! Tit for Tat Once upon a time, there lived a man called Chester, who was very rich, but at the same time, as stingy and miserly as he could be. He had a housekeeper called Magda. In his young days, Chester had been one of the most active kids in the neighborhood. But as he grew old and stiff, he found it very difficult to walk, and his faithful servant urged him to get a horse. At last, Chester betook himself one day to the market, where he had seen a mule, and which he bought for seven gold pieces. Now it happened that three thieves were hanging about the marketplace, who much preferred living off of other people's hard work instead of their own. As soon as they saw that Chester had bought a mule, one of them said to his two companions, My friends, this mule must be ours. But how shall we manage it? We must all three station ourselves at places along the old man's homeward way, and must each in his turn declare that the mule he has bought is a donkey. If we stick to our story, the mule will soon be ours. This plan quite satisfied the others, and they all split up to wait for him along his path. When Chester came by, the first thief said to him, God bless you, my fine gentleman. Ah, uh, thanks for your courtesy. Where have you been? To the market. And what did you buy there? This mule. Which mule? The one I'm sitting upon. Are you in serious or only joking? What do you mean? Because it seems to me you got a hold of a donkey and not of a mule. A donkey? Rubbish. And without another word, he rode on his way. After a few hundred yards, he met the second thief, who addressed him. Good day, sir. Where are you coming from? From the market. Did things go pretty cheap? I should just think so. And did you make any good bargain for yourself? I bought this mule, upon which you see me. <laughs> but good heavens! It's nothing but a donkey! A donkey? You don't mean to say so. If a single another person tells me that, I'll have to get rid of this wretched animal. And he continued his way, and very soon met the third thief, who said to him, God bless you, sir. Are you any by chance coming from the market? Yes, yes I am. And what bargain did you drive there? I bought this mule upon which I am riding. A mule? <laughs> You can't be serious. Are you trying to make a fool of me? Uh, yes, I'm serious. Why would I joke about my mule? Oh, my poor friend. Can't you tell the difference between a mule and a donkey? You're the third person in the last two hours who has told me the same thing, but I wouldn't believe it. And dismounting from the mule, he spoke. Keep the animal. I'm embarrassed to have been duped at the market. The clever thief took the beast and rode on to join his fellow criminals, while Chester continued his journey on foot. As soon as the old man got home, he told his housekeeper that he had bought Donkey under the belief it was a mule, and all the story till the end. Oh dear sir, don't you see that they played a trick on you? They fooled you! They must be thieves! Uh, never mind, I will teach them a good lesson now. Then, Chester bought two identical twin goats, paid as small a price for them, and leading them home with him, he told Magda to prepare a good meal, as he was going to invite some friends to dinner. He ordered her to roast some ham and to boil a pair of chickens, and told her to bake the best cake she could make. Then, 
he took one of the goats and tied it to a post in the courtyard and gave it some grass to eat. Then he took the other goat and led it to the market. Just as soon as he had arrived, the three thieves saw him and decided to greet him. Welcome, Mr. Chester. What brings you here? I've come to get some provisions, because some friends are coming to dine with me today, and it would give me much pleasure if you were to honor me with your company also. The thieves willingly accepted this invitation, and Chester had made all his purchases. He tied them onto the goat's back and said to it, in the presence of the three conmen, Go home now and tell Magna to roast the ham and boil the chickens and bake the best cake she can make. Now go fast, we will come on later. As soon as he untied his goat, it ran off as quickly as it could, and Chester walked with the three men for a while in the market, and then they all traveled to his home. When he and his guests entered the courtyard, they noticed the goat tied to the post quietly chewing the grass. They were astonished at this, for, of course, they thought it was the same goat that Chester had sent home loaded with provisions. As soon as they reached the house, Mr. Chester said to his housekeeper, Well, Magda, have you done what I told the goat to tell you to do? The clever woman understood her master and answered, Certainly I have. The ham is roasted and the chickens boiled. That's all right. When the three rogues saw the cooked meats and the cake in the oven and heard Magda's words, they were amazed and began to consult at once how they were to get the goat into their possession. At last, towards the end of the meal, one of them said to Chester, My worthy host, you must sell your goat to us. Chester replied that he was most unwilling to part with the creature, as no amount of money could make up to him for its loss. Still, if they were quite set on it, he would let them have the goat for fifty gold pieces. The thieves paid the fifty gold pieces at once and left the house quite happily, leading the goat with them. When they got home, they said to their wives, Don't cook the dinner tomorrow until we send a messenger home. The following day, they went to the market and bought chickens, and after they had packed them on the back of the talking goat, they told it all the meals they wished their wives to prepare. As soon as the goat was untied, it ran as quickly as it could. When the dinner hour approached, all three went home and asked their wives for the dinner. Oh, you fools and blockheads! How could you ever believe for a moment that a goat would do the work of a servant maid? You've been finally deceived for what you've done with others. This is what they call tit for tat. The End The Magic Stag There were once a brother and sister who loved each other dearly. Their parents were dead. When they were very young, their mother had died and their father was ill. Before their father died, he married again. But their stepmother was most unkind and cruel to them. One day, the boy said to the sister, Dear little sister, our stepmother gives us dry hard bread crusts for dinner and supper and threatens to kick us out of the house. Let's run away and see what the world is like. So they went out and wandered here and there till evening. At the end of the day, they were in a large forest. It began to rain. They were tired and hungry and sad. They crept into a hollow tree and slept till morning. When they awoke, they left their place of shelter and wandered away in search of water. Oh, I am so thirsty. If we could only find a brook or a stream. Listen, I think I hear a running stream. So he took his sister by the hand and they ran together to find it. Now the stepmother of these children was a wicked witch. She had followed them into the night and bewitched all the springs and streams in the forest. Brother and sister reached the brook, and the sister heard the babbling of the brook. Whoever drinks of me, a tiger soon will be. Whoa! Brother, wait! 
Do not drink, or you will become a wild beast and tear me to pieces. Thirsty as he was, the brother conquered his desire to drink at her words, and said, Dear sister, I will wait till we come to a spring. So they wandered farther, but as they approached, she again heard the bubbling of a spring. Who drinks of me? A wolf will be. Brother, I pray you do not drink of this spring. You will be changed into a wolf and devour me. Again, the brother denied himself and promised to wait. But he said, At the next stream, I must drink. My thirst is so great. Not far off ran a pretty streamlet. But here also, in the murmuring waters, the sister heard the words. Mm, who dares to drink of me? Turn to a stag will be. Dear brother, do not drink, she began. But she was too late, for her brother had already knelt to drink, and he became a fawn. But he did not run away, and stayed close to her. So she said, Stand still, dear fawn, don't fear. I must take care of you. I will never leave you. So she untied her golden garter and fastened it around the neck of the fawn. Then she gathered some soft green rushes and braided them into a soft string, which she fastened to the fawn's golden collar, and then led him away into the depths of the forest. After wandering about for some time, she at last found a little abandoned hut, and she thought it would form a nice shelter for them both. So she led the fawn in and closed the door. Every morning, she went out to gather berries for her own, and fresh grass for the fawn, which he ate out of her hand, and then he went out with her and played. After they had been alone in the forest for years, the little sister had grown into a lovely maiden and the fawn a large stag. Once a prince came to the forest with his hunting party. The sounding horn, the barking of the dogs, the yelling of the huntsmen resounded through the forest and was heard by the stag. He begged his sister to let him go to see. She opened the door and said, I will let you go, but do not forget to say, Dear sister, let me in when you return this evening. The chief hunter very soon spied the beautiful stag with the golden collar, pointed it out to the prince, and they determined to hunt it. They chased him with all their skill, but he was too light and nimble for them to catch. And after the huntsmen were gone, he walked home. But one of the prince's huntsmen, however, determined to follow him at a distance to find out where he went. The huntsman was very surprised to see the stag go up to a door and knock and hear him speak. Dear sister, let me in. The door was only opened a little way and quickly shut. But the huntsman had seen enough to amaze him. And when he returned to tell the prince what he had seen, the prince was amazed too. We will have to discover this mystery. The next morning, the huntsman led the prince to the cottage. When the prince saw it, he went on alone. The door was ajar. The king stepped in, and in great astonishment, saw a maiden more beautiful than he had ever seen standing before him. She looked frightened. After a little talk, he held her hand and said, Will you go with me to my castle and be my dear wife? Uh, yes, I would go willingly, but I cannot leave my dear stag. He must go with me. He shall remain with you as long as you live. While they were talking, the stag rose up, looking happy. Soon after, their marriage was celebrated with great splendor. The wicked stepmother, who had caused these two young people such misery, heard of their happiness. Envy and malice arose in her heart, and she has sworn to destroy them. She disguised herself as a nurse, and came to the castle when the queen had a baby, and the prince hired her to take care of the queen and newborn. She locked the queen up in the bathroom, and picked a baby from his cradle to throw him out of queen's balcony. 
But then the stag came to rescue, and he saved his nephew. The king came into the queen chambers, and he saw that the stag was protecting the baby from the nurse. And the queen recognized her as the witch stepmother. She told the king how cruelly she had been treated by her stepmother, and so the king sent her to the prison. The stepmother realized her mistake, and so she broke the spell, which held the queen's brother in the form of a stag. He appeared before them, a tall, handsome young man. After this, everyone lived happily and peacefully for the rest of their lives. The end. If you enjoyed this story, please like and subscribe our channel, and press the bell icon to get future updates. And don't forget to comment. The Magical Wishing Pond. Once upon a time, there was a little princess named Jasmine. She was her father's only child, and she was spoiled. She was very stubborn and very selfish. She was always hungry for delicious food. One day, a magician visited the king to give him blessings and to warn him about a magical wishing pond within his dynasty. O、oh, king. I came here to give you an ominous warning. Ooh, about a wishing pond in your state, which is. At the same time, little Jasmine was passing by the courtroom, and she saw the magician talking to her father. She got excited when she heard about the magical wishing pond. As soon as she heard about a magical wishing pond, she ran to her room without staying to listen to the magician's full sentence. I must go to the magical wishing pond to ask for delicious food. The next day morning, Jasmine hurriedly got ready and started her journey towards the pond. At noon, she reached it with few gold coins in her pocket. She wanted to wish for many things, like a delicious cake. Ice cream, hamburger, pizza, crispy turkey, chocolates, cookies, and many more. But when she read the warning sign at the pond, she was disappointed. It said, "One wish per person." Magic pond, magic pond, give me a wish. Grant me a food pot, which will give me a treat. Suddenly, a magical pot came up from the pond, following. A whisper. Here is your wish. What you ask for. Follow my instructions, or it will work not. You have to say three magical words: ting, tong, twang. Then the magical pot will begin making delicious food. It will fulfill your hungriest desires. But do not forget to say "stop pot stop," or else it will make food non-stop. Okay, whatever. Jasmine came back to her palace. She was very curious about the magical pot, and mumbled the magical words: "Ting tong twain, I want chocolate cake and cocoa pudding." Magically, the pot started making a fountain of chocolate pudding and cake. Jasmine dove in and ate as though she were starving. Days and days passed as she asked for her every kind of food she could think of. She started to gain lots of weight. One day, King visited her. He saw a fat kid eating a chicken leg, and he came near. He didn't realize it was his daughter until he came closer. He was surprised and said. Oh, my, my dear princess, what have you done to yourself? Father, I visited a magical wishing pond a few days earlier and asked for a magic food pot. Now, for the last few days, I've been making wishes for food, and last night I forgot the magical words to stop the pot. The king realized how selfish and greedy she was, and he held the crying princess in his arms and said. Dear princess, you never listen to anyone. 
I know you heard that magician talk about the magical wishing pond, but you must not have listened to everything he said. Oh, King, I came here to give you an ominous warning. Ooh. A wishing pond in your state, which grants wishes, but those wishes always come with a consequence. It is an evil magical pond. I suggest you destroy it as soon as possible. Now you know, my dear princess, why this is happening. Then the king summoned his guards and ordered, Pick up that pot and burn it in the fire. Immediately, guards followed the instructions and they put the pot in the burning stove and watched till it melted and turned to ashes. Afterward, the princess started to do daily exercise, and soon she came into her original shape. After that, they lived happily forever. Moral of the story, never act on half-heard stories. The End The Goose Girl Once upon a time, there was an old queen who had a beautiful daughter. And when the princess grew up, she was betrothed to a prince who lived in a far, far away kingdom. Mother, do I have to do this? Yes, my dear daughter. I gave the prince my word that you would marry him. But I want to stay here with you. I am old and I will soon be gone. I want you to have a husband who will protect you. I don't want to leave you, mother. But if you say so, I will go. I don't want you to go alone, so my maidservant, Aisha, is going with you. Is your horse ready? Yes, mother. We are both ready to go now. Remember that Aisha is loyal to me and I'm sure that she will tell me everything that happens to you. Yes, I know, Mother. Don't worry. The queen and her daughter went outside of the palace, where the maid and the horses were waiting. Let's go, Aisha. As you wish, princess. Goodbye, then. But what the queen did not know was that Aisha was angry inside, and jealous and greedy. She wanted to be a princess and didn't like the queen's daughter at all. The princess and the maid mounted their horses and left the palace. After many hours of traveling, the princess was thirsty and said to her maid, Please, Aisha, bring me some water from the stream. Get it yourself if you're thirsty. Just lie down at the river and drink from it. The princess was humble. She got off her horse bent down over the water in the stream, and drank and mounted her horse again. Then the maid said, From now on, I give the orders and you must obey me. Now, take off your dress and give it to me, and you will wear mine. I am now the princess. Promise me that you will not tell anybody about this, or you will regret it. I promise. So the maid wore the princess's dress, and mounted the princess's horse. The horse seemed to sense that he should be carrying the real princess and didn't quite obey Aisha's orders. But eventually, the two women arrived at the royal palace, where the prince came out to meet them. Welcome to my palace, dear princess. Who is the girl? She's my maidservant. She's traveled with me from my kingdom, but I don't like her. Perhaps we can put it a work in your kingdom. She's of no use to me now. Well, I have a little boy named Conrad who takes care of the geese. I guess we can help him. Oh, and by the way, please kill my horse. <laughs> what? What? Why? He seems like such a nice horse. I almost died on the road because of him. Aisha knew that the princess's horse was actually a magical speaking horse, and that he might tell someone that she was not the princess. I can't kill your horse, but if you wish, I will put him in the lockup. Thank you. Nay. And the horse was locked in a place where nobody could see him again. 
The next day, Aisha went to see the princess. <laughs> you will never see your horse again. Why are you doing this to me? Keep working, or I'll tell the prince to get rid of you too. The maid left, and the princess started crying. Suddenly, an old stableman approached her and said, "Don't worry, I know where your horse is. I will take you to where they keep him." Oh, thank you, good man. There, Conrad was hiding behind a bush and listened to the whole conversation. And he thought, "Hmm, this sounds interesting. I will also be here. Maybe, just maybe, the king will know about this too." Stableman took the princess to see the horse. Conrad was hiding behind them. Here we are. Now you'll have to be careful. I will. The old man left, and the princess went inside the palace where the horse was. Conrad followed her. As soon as she saw the horse, she said, "Oh, my poor horsey! What have they done to you?" Well, my princess, you are also suffering. If only a mother knew, her heart would break. Conrad was astonished when he saw that the horse could speak. Oh my! Am I crazy? The horse can talk. I must tell the prince, but will he believe me? I don't know. I've got to go think about this. While he was thinking about this, the princess left. The next morning, everything was normal as usual. The princess started combing her hair, which was like pure gold. Conrad wanted to pluck out a few hairs. Conrad, stop bothering me! Leave my hair alone. But your hair is so lovely. Do you want me to braid your hair? No, stop it, Conrad. But I want some of your hair. Leave me alone! The princess yelled, and then she spoke to the wind. Blow, blow, gentle wind! I say, blow Conrad's little hat away and make him chase it here and there until I have braided all my hair. And there came such a violent wind that it blew Conrad's hat far away across country, and he was forced to run after it. When he came back, she had finished combing her hair. Conrad was angry, and he left and went straight to see the prince. Your Majesty, I don't. Want to be near that girl again? I'm scared. She is just an innocent girl. How can you be so afraid of her? No, Your Majesty. I think she's a witch, a very bad witch. A witch? You should have told me that in the first place. Come on, tell me everything. Well, see, Your Majesty. The other day, I overheard the horse. Conrad told the king everything he knew about the princess and her horse, and about the way the wind blew his hat. Go home now, Conrad. I will take care of everything. The next day, the prince hid near the place where Horsey was, and he waited until the princess came to see the horse. Good morning, my dear Horsey. Good morning, my dear princess. If only your mother knew what you are going through. Her heart would break. The prince heard the conversation, but he also saw how Conrad bothered the princess, and how the wind blew his hat. Then, without being seen, he went away. Next day, he asked to talk to the girl in the servant clothes, who was the real princess, my Majesty. Do you want to talk with me? Yes, please tell me. Is there something bothering you? I mean. I've been watching you, and I know that it is something wrong. You can trust me. Princess wept bitterly. Then she emptied her whole heart. She told everything. The prince listened carefully and said, "My dear child, I knew there was something wrong with that woman. Your maid Aisha deserves to be punished. She will be locked away in jail forever, and I will marry you." Oh, king, thank you. But what about my horsey? Don't worry about him. He will be free. The next day, the wedding was celebrated at the palace. There was a great feast, and the royal couple lived happily ever after, forever. The end. The magical golden crab. Once upon a time, there was a fisherman and his wife named Jack and Ilsebil. Who lived together in a filthy shack near the sea? 
Every day, the fisherman went out fishing. Once he was sitting there fishing and looking into the clear water. His hook went to the bottom, deep down, and when he pulled it out, he had caught a large golden crab. The crab said to him, "Listen, fisherman, I beg you to let me live. I'm not an ordinary golden crab. I'm special. I'm enchanted. Put me back into the water and let me swim." Well, you do look golden, but how do I know you're an enchanted crab, dude? Either I'm an enchanted talking crab, or you're losing your mind and talking to the wildlife. Well, that's a fair point. Maybe I am going crazy, <sighs> but I guess if I am, there's no harm in letting you go, talking crab. With that, he put it back into the clear water, and the golden crab disappeared to the bottom. Then the fisherman got up and went home to his wife in the filthy shack. Jack, did you catch anything today? No, I caught a golden crab, but he told me that he was an enchanted creature, so I let him swim away. Didn't you ask for anything first? No. What am I going to get from a talking crab? Well, how about a house? This awful shack is filthy and it stinks, and I can see cracks in the roof. Go back and tell him that we want to have a little cottage. Wait. So, a talking crab is like a genie in the lamp. I could just make wishes. I never knew that. Actually, I have no idea. But any time you catch something golden and it talks, find out if it's one of those fairy tale things and ask it for something. The man did not want to go back outside, but he didn't want to argue either. So he went back to the sea. He yelled out to the waves, "Crab! Oh, crab! In the sea, come, I pray, here to me." For my wife, good Ilsebil, I bring the wish which you fulfill. The golden crab swam up and said, "Dude, what are you talking about? Uh, my wife says she doesn't want to live in a filthy shack any longer. She would like to have a cottage. And you think asking a talking crab is going to improve your housing situation? Um, yeah. Uh, like I don't know." A, a, a wish? Okay, fine. Your wish is granted. Go home. The man went home, and his wife was standing in the door of a little cottage, and she said to him, "Come in. See, now isn't this much better?" Ah,、uh, yes, this is lovely. We can live here contentedly. Well, probably. We'll see. Everything went well for a week or two. And then the woman said, "Listen, husband, this cottage is too small. The golden crab could have given us a larger house. I would like to live in a large stone palace. Go back to the golden crab and tell him to give us a palace." The man didn't feel right about asking the crab for something else, but he went anyway. He stood near the water and said, "Crab." Oh crab in the sea, come I pray here to me. For my wife named Ilsebil, I bring the wish, which you fulfill. Hello again, fisherman. What does she want now? Oh, my wife wants to live in a stone palace. Said the man sadly. Go home. She'll be standing on the stone porch. Then the man went his way. When he arrived, standing there was a large stone palace. His wife was standing on the stairway, about to enter. Taking him by the hand, she said, "Come inside. Now, isn't this nice?" Yes, this is quite enough. We can live in this beautiful palace and be satisfied. Ah,、uh, we'll see. Let's sleep on it. The next morning. The woman woke up 
then poked him in the side with her elbow and said, Husband, I cannot stand it any longer. Go to the golden crab and tell him I must become emperor. Oh, honey, I can't tell the golden crab to do that. There's only one emperor in the realm. What? If he can give me a palace, then he can make me emperor. Go there immediately. So he had to go. As he went on his way, the frightened man thought to himself, This is not going to end well. The golden crab is going to get tired of this. But he went anyway, and said again at the sea, Crab, oh crab in the sea, come, I pray, here to me. For my wife, greedy Ilsa Bill, I bring the wish which you fulfill. What does she want now? Oh, golden crab, my wife wants to become emperor. Go home. She's already emperor. Then the man went home, and when he arrived there, the entire palace was made of polished marble. He went inside, where his wife was sitting on a throne made of gold, and she was wearing a golden crown. When they went to bed, she was still not satisfied. Her greed would not let her sleep. She kept thinking what she wanted to become next. Then the sun was about to rise, and when she watched, she poked her husband with her elbow. Husband, I want to be in charge of the sun and moon, too. She looked at him so sternly that he shuddered. Go to Crab immediately. I want to become God. The fisherman fell on his knees before her. Elsa Bill, this has gone too far. I beg you, be satisfied and content where you are. Anger came over her. She kicked him with her foot and shouted, I cannot stand it any longer. Go there immediately. He ran away from his angry wife. Outside, such a storm was raging that he could hardly stand on his feet. The sky was as black as pitch. There was thunder and lightning. He cried again. Crab, oh crab in the sea, come, I pray, hear to me. For my wife, greedy Ilsebil, I bring the wish which you fulfill. What does she want then? Oh, she wants to become God. Go home. She is now God. Then the man went home, arriving there. Everything was gone like there was nothing in there ever before. And he can't see his wife anywhere. He hurried back to the crab and asked, Where's my wife? God is present here and everywhere. Nothing exists separate from the one God, because God is present everywhere. You can't see your wife, because now she is everywhere. The fisherman wept bitterly, and he asked for mercy. The fisherman had speared his life only once, but the golden crab felt bad for him. And he said, Now I can fulfill your wish just once more, but ask wisely. Please, I want to see my wife happily standing at the door of our old shack. Go home. Your wish is granted. By saying this, the golden crab disappeared. And the fisherman went back to his home. And then he sees his wife standing in the door of his old shack with a pretty smile on her face. After this, she remained content and loved living together with her husband. And they lived happily ever after. The End